This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. The U.S. Navy made effective use of two powerful weapons which had not theretofore been employed to any extent. One was the carrier, a mobile airstrip from which planes were launched within easy range of enemy targets in the far corners of the Pacific. The other was the submarine. The war with Japan across the broad stretches of the Pacific constituted the greatest naval struggle in history. That war was fought not only on the surface of the sea, but above and beneath it as well. Advanced techniques for waging war called for improved facilities for treating the men injured in this new kind of warfare. The employment of the machines of modern war necessitated not only a drastic change in the strategy of warfare, but required streamlined methods for saving the lives of the fighting men who fell victim to this high-speed 20th century type of battle. In a large percentage of cases, the saving of these lives depended directly on quick treatment of the wounds. In the U.S. Navy, ships waging war against the enemy anywhere in the Pacific had to be prepared to deal efficiently with the most difficult cases. The maintenance of these shipboard hospitals in constant readiness for any emergency was one small function of the Navy's complex supply system. During World War II in the Pacific, the U.S. Navy was confronted with a supply problem unprecedented in history. To provide desperately needed materiel to its ships at sea and to bases all over the broad Pacific, the Navy went into the exporting business on a large scale. At U.S. ports, the equipment and supplies bound for American fighting men in the Pacific Asiatic Theater were prepared for shipment. It was no wonder there was a shortage of code names with so many islands in the Pacific to label. A most vital consideration in fighting a war across the Pacific was, of course, the maintenance of U.S. fleets in top condition, equipped with every facility necessary to the conduct of a successful amphibious drive westward to Japan. In World War II, the U.S. Navy grew to proportions never dreamed of by even the most optimistic old line admiral. But the Navy was concerned not only with war at sea, its supply service stored and transported the machines of war needed in the countless land campaigns against the enemy in the Pacific. Another high priority cargo on Navy transports was the American fighting man, who was in the last analysis the most important factor in the outcome of the war. The job of keeping all the Navy's warships all across the Pacific in fighting shape was in itself a demanding operation. The ability of a naval task force to wage war for an extended period was directly related to the speed and efficiency of the Navy's supply service. The great cruising range of the U.S. fleets in the Pacific was made possible only by means of regular rendezvous between the warships and supply vessels, which delivered everything from aspirin to ammunition. In enemy waters particularly, nothing which might act as a marker for an enemy ship or plane could be simply thrown overboard. Of all the items transported to the fighting men from the U.S., mail ranked close to the top of the list of most important cargo. The arrival of a fresh batch of mail always had a tonic effect on the men. The armed services soon came to realize there was nothing that could lift a man's morale so quickly as a letter from home. History Hits 
is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. History Hit covers an extensive range of military history to appeal to whatever period you are looking for, from the Battle of Trafalgar and the Revolutionary Era, right through to the Second World War and conflict in the 20th century. If you are looking for your next military history fix, then this is the service for you. Not only that, but we have a huge podcast network releasing new episodes every day, so you'll always have something to listen to. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial, and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. Tony! Romania! Paris! But even the Navy's fleet post office couldn't come through 100% every time. Sometimes, luckily not very often, a valuable shipment of supplies would fail to reach its destination due either to accident or enemy action. Keeping the ships of the line in good repair was also, in large measure, the job of the Navy Supply Service. At strategic points across the Pacific, naval facilities were prepared to put crippled ships into top fighting condition in short order. To achieve those miracles of repair, some of the Navy's far-flung bases were as well equipped as Navy yards in the U.S. One of the most demanding assignments on the Navy Supply System's crowded schedule was the transporting of the material needed for the launching of large-scale invasions against the enemy. But the movement of vehicles, weapons, and supplies to bases in the far Pacific was only part of the job. Each invasion, large and small, would involve still another trip across water to the ultimate objective. 20th century naval warfare bore little resemblance to the classic sea battles of earlier generations. During World War II, the submarine was used to good advantage by the U.S. Navy, and especially so in the Pacific. The departure of a sub on a dangerous mission was always a dramatic moment for everyone involved. It might be several months before she'd make home port again, if she was lucky. Throughout the war in the Pacific, the submarines of the U.S. Navy were manned by volunteers only. The inside of a sub was no place for a man with claustrophobia. Each sub was a living, breathing being to the men and the crew, who were fiercely proud of their vessel. A lot of people used to ask me why I volunteered for the submarine service. They couldn't understand anyone wanting to spend months at a time cooped up with little chance for escape if anything happened. But it wasn't so bad, especially during the early days just out of port. For my money, life on a sub had crouching in a muddy foxhole beat six ways to Sunday. taking a look around every now and then. You never knew when you might come across something interesting. Overtaking a Japanese junk meant a break in the routine of the patrol. It was easy to imagine the excitement the pirates must have had in the old days. And after being down below for quite a while, we felt as though we were really in the war when we hauled in Honest to Pete live Japs. We never managed to take many prisoners, and it's just as well, considering our limited quarters. Our prize was quickly disposed of. 
Any prisoners we took were always given a good going over. Every once in a while, we actually got some tips on what the enemy was up to. It wasn't hard to tell when we moved into enemy waters. There was a change in the atmosphere. The lookouts kept a sharper watch. Sighting our first enemy ship was one of the most exciting moments of the patrol. The lives of the crew depended on how fast the sub got underwater. Moving in on the enemy was a slow, careful business, but we all had the routine down cold. The ideal position was about a thousand yards from the target, if it was possible to get that close without being detected. It was important that we be patient. Our position had to be just right for us to score the best possible hit. Down periscope. Angle on the bow, starboard 15. Right full rudder. Right full rudder. Hull ahead two thirds. Hull ahead two thirds. New course 240. New course 240. What's the distance to the track? 17 double up. Control, 63 feet. Fire one. Walking up another chunk of enemy tonnage gave us a thrill every time. But sometimes that feeling didn't last long. If an enemy destroyer was in the neighborhood, there was a good chance we'd be detected. Take her down. We could expect a depth charge any second. We could be sure there'd be more ash cans dropped than us if we didn't shake him right away. Needless to say, we didn't waste any time doing just that. On most patrols, we stayed in enemy waters for several weeks before heading back to our base. Sometimes weeks went by without meeting a thing. But every minute we were out, we had to be ready to act quick the second we spotted the enemy. For American sub crews, Several months in enemy waters was the longest stretch without a break. Like the Navy's planes and ships, the boats proudly displayed their record against the enemy. During World War II in the Pacific, submarines were sometimes used to transport Army or Marine raiders on quick strikes against enemy-held islands. Whatever the assignment, the submariners could be counted on to do the job well. On Oahu at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, the men of the submarine service had every opportunity to take their minds off the war. The Navy had taken over the hotel and submariners had number one priority. The men of the silent service could have almost anything their heart desired. Usually, a submariner's leave at the Royal Hawaiian was for two carefree weeks. At Waikiki Beach, the war seemed a million miles away. On their leave, the submariners had a chance to navigate above the surface of the water for a change. Free of their cramped quarters for a few weeks, some of the men welcomed the chance to get the kinks out of their legs. The U.S. Navy's victories during World War II in the Pacific were due in large measure to the outstanding performance of her carriers. And that performance was possible only through a high degree of teamwork on the part of each of the men and the crews of those fighting ships. The job of loading the planes with the missiles which would soon be deposited on the enemy was quickly accomplished. The men who armed the planes felt just as much a part of the strike against the enemy as the pilots themselves. 
Of the carrier's complement, the pilots were, in one sense, the most important members of the team. Before a mission, everything possible was done to help them to relax. <laughs> In the ready room, the airmen were briefed for the last time. Any new bits of intelligence about enemy activities on the target island were included. Man all flight quarter station. As the time for the strike drew near, the crew went into action. Some stood by, prepared to cope with a sudden fire. Others readied the planes for the launching. Parker, tell the pilots to man the plane. Aye, aye, sir. Ready room from flight control. Pilots, man your plane. While the flat top turned into the wind, the pilots prepared for the takeoff. For some of the new pilots, this was it. With everyone on the mark, the strike was officially begun. Stand by to start engine. Stand clear of propellers. Start engine. Each man on the ship had a specific assignment. No matter how small, each job had to be performed without a hitch, or the entire operation would be upset. Finally, with its wings unfolded and locked into place, the lead plane was all set to go. when there wasn't much wind, the planes could not be launched in the usual way. But there was no need to postpone the strike. In that kind of weather, a catapult was used to push the planes into the air. Throughout World War II, U.S. carrier-based planes kept up a steady attack against the enemy in the Pacific. Carrier pilots flew tens of thousands of sorties against enemy shipping, aircraft, and land bases. In a great percentage of cases, the enemy targets could be reached only by carrier-based planes. Returning from a strike, the airmen flew the most direct course back to that welcome speck on the sea. Taking the planes back aboard was an even more exacting operation than the launching. Once a pilot was given a come ahead, he didn't waste any time getting himself and his plane back onto the flight deck. The landing signal officer guided him in. Once again, every part of the operation had to be accomplished with great speed. While the flat top was taking her planes aboard, she was vulnerable to enemy attack since she could not maneuver. The planes had to be landed in the shortest possible space of time. Once a plane was safely aboard, the deck was prepared for the next arrival in a matter of seconds. The returning aircraft were quickly moved to their assigned positions on the flight deck. 
On a carrier in action, deck space was at a premium. Every available square foot was utilized. Sometimes the landing signal officer had a real cause for worry. The firefighters and other crewmen moved fast. An accident really upset the landing pattern, especially when there was more than one plane in distress. Sometimes a pilot in trouble wouldn't even try to make the ship. Rockets had to be jettisoned. Then the airmen made ready to leave the plane as soon as it hit. This would have to be the most skillful landing of his career. The downed pilot was in luck. Once out of the plane, the pilot had a rubber life raft handy to make his stay in the water a good deal safer and more comfortable. During World War II in the Pacific Theater, hundreds of carrier pilots were able to cheat death, thanks to the equipment which the Navy had provided for such situations. If necessary, the pilot could exist for an extended period on the raft inasmuch as he was well supplied with food and water, as well as preparations for combating the elements. But for a pilot who had been spotted by a fellow American airman, the stay in the raft would not be a long one. The Air Sea Rescue Service could be counted on to function quickly. In a very short time, a Navy patrol plane would arrive, and the downed pilot's troubles were just about over. In some cases, depending of course on the location, a pilot who was forced to ditch his plane was picked up within an hour and none the worse for the experience. In no time at all, he would be back at a base, ready to become part of another flat tops complement of flyers. In late 1943 and early 44, the Japanese wall of defense in the Pacific was punctured by fast U.S. carrier fleets. To the north, Marcus Island was hit hard. A heavy raid was made on the Marianas. Another carrier task force hit Truk with devastating results. Toward the end of 1944, Formosa became a prime target for U.S. Navy carrier forces. For several months in late 1944 and early 1945, Navy carriers spanned the Pacific, almost to the Asian mainland, to get in position for the attacks. Marine pilots supplemented regular Navy carrier airmen in the strikes against the enemy's important island stronghold off the China coast. 120 miles from the target, the planes were ready for the attack. The crewmen functioned almost automatically, so familiar was the pattern of the takeoff operation. The carrier strikes on important enemy islands helped materially to shorten the span of time involved in bringing the war to the enemy's doorstep. The Japanese on Formosa fought back stubbornly. But the carrier planes continued to press the attack. 
impossible to assess exactly the amount of damage done to the enemy by carrier-based aircraft during World War II. But it has been proved beyond any doubt that the flat top was one of the Navy's most potent weapons in the Pacific. Early in 1944, the Marshall Islands were the principal objective for U.S. amphibious forces in the Central Pacific. On January 31st, they invaded Kwajalein. In early 1942, with the Japanese in control of all the Philippines, the U.S. position in the Pacific was bleak indeed. With the fall of Corregidor in May, the Japanese greatly increased the area of their domination. Below the equator, the enemy began making landings on the northern coast of strategic New Guinea as early as March 1942. For the U.S., the job ahead was an enormous one. In Australia, American troops arrived in larger numbers as mid-1942 drew near to prepare for the moment when the offensive against the enemy could be seized. In the southwest Pacific, New Guinea was the major battlefield where the Japanese and the Allies were finally to come to grips. Its spine was a rugged mountain range, tapering off into thick jungle. The Japanese were intent on pushing their advance even farther south. From nearby island bases, Japanese planes moved out in the first of a series of raids on the island continent. Control of the air in the equatorial zone off the mainland of Asia had been seized by the Japanese who were able to fly over most of that territory with little fear of opposition. Japanese pilots ventured with impunity to the shores of Australia itself. The Australian port city of Darwin came under attack by Japanese planes some 50 times during 1942. In those early raids, the enemy had a relatively easy time of it. In late August 1942, Milne Bay at the tip of New Guinea became the newest Japanese invasion target. Seizure of the Milne Bay area was an important step in Japanese plans to gain control of all of New Guinea. But the invasion was not unopposed. Allied planes went to work on the enemy amphibious force. The Milne Bay area was not to be the enemies for the taking. The Japanese invasion troops gained a slim foothold, but were hit hard by U.S. bombers. American planes concentrated on the enemy's supply centers and badly crippled the Japanese beachhead operation. For several days, the invaders fought for a firm foothold. Finally, the enemy invasion force gave up the battle. For the first time in World War II, a Japanese offensive had been beaten off. The enemy amphibious force returned to its base. Overland in New Guinea, Japanese and Allied troops were separated by the formidable Owen Stanley Mountains. But the Japanese were filtering across that row of jagged ridges. Australian troops, the principal Allied ground forces in New Guinea for some months, were all that stood between the enemy and the rich rubber plantation country surrounding Port Moresby. To the Aussies fell the job of driving the enemy back. The route lay from Port Moresby across the precipitous Owen Stanleys to Buna on the northeast coast. The men who were to fight their way through that hazardous country along the Kokoda Trail were the diggers, Aussie soldiers of the 7th Division. For eight grueling weeks, Beginning in late September 1942, the 7th Division Aussies drove doggedly across the mountains under conditions which would have stopped many a fighting force. But the Aussies never let down. In spite of the trying conditions, the morale of the fighting men was good, right down to the privates and lance corporals. Pushing along the Kokoda Trail took some doing. 
The country was tough, and we even got used to crossing swamps. If we had had the ruddy Japs in the open, we could have mopped them up quicker than you could have said Jack Robinson. But it wasn't that easy in New Guinea. Most of our blokes were in good condition, but fair dinkum the jungle took it out of a man. There was always something needed doing, even when the Jap wasn't about. Now and then we stopped for a bit of tucker and a quick look at a snapshot of that Sheila in Sydney. And we couldn't let ourselves go to the pack even though we weren't in very civilized country. But the stops were short. It was always time to push on again, through the jungle and on up the trail. Every time a twig snapped in front of us or behind us, chances were it'd be a Jap. And most of the time the twigs didn't snap. The Japs knew this kind of country like a book. When we did find them, we'd give them a good doing over. We knew dead to right some Japs wouldn't be bothering us again. Day and night we had to be on the watch. Often New Guinea seemed to be covered with nothing but kunai grass. But sometimes we'd feel we were getting somewhere. We knew there were Japs ahead and we had an idea there might be some back of us. There was no way of knowing. It was up and up till it seemed we'd soon be in the clouds. If there were any mountains higher than the Owen Stanleys, we didn't want to hear about them. Just when we felt all in, something would happen to buck us up. If that was a supply train, we couldn't take a ruddy chance of him missing us. But a thin smoke signal in the Owen Stanleys wasn't always easy to spot. In the air, Yank pilots were looking for signals just like ours. We must have been in a good position, and we were pretty lucky, too. At any rate, our signal was spotted by the sharp-eyed Yanks. We didn't know it at the time, but there were Aussies in that plane, too. And at the right time, they did an A-1 job. The rations usually got to us just when we were running a bit short. Thanks to the Yanks and some of our own blokes too, we wouldn't have to be living off the jungle. There's nothing like running out of grub to set a man to thinking about food. Before those packets hit the ground, we were after them. Talk about manna from heaven. Sometimes when the Yank pilots couldn't spot any diggers, they'd drop their load into native villages along the trail. The boons, that's what we call them, were a little scared at first. When our boys got hit, they were in good hands in a native village. We were well taken care of by the fuzzy wuzzies. Most of them never let us down. Nothing like a fancy dinner in Melbourne, perhaps, but a feast, believe me. After climbing the blasted trail, it was heaven to pitch into some bully beef and biscuits. News from home was just what the doctor ordered. Our gear got a bit of trimming up every now and again. Then we'd shove off again, up the sides of the Razorbacks. The top seemed thousands of miles away. Our cobbers, the Boongs, gave us a hand as we got near the ridge. They were as sure-footed as mountain goats and much handier to have around. Up near the top, we had to be especially lively about keeping an eye open for the enemy. We were about due for another scrap. We smelled trouble, so we thought it might be a good plan to have a look-see. And it turned out to be a good idea. Some Jap's numbers were coming up. 
on the enemy positions was sometimes an Allied show. Yank planes would give us air support when we needed it to help knock out a strong point. The Yanks poured it on. On the ground, we tackle the job from a different angle. The job was done, but we didn't come through unhurt. Moving our wounded back in that going wasn't easy. We were doubly glad to have the booms with us when any of our boys had to be taken out. The men got the most careful handling possible in that country. These wild New Guinea natives were about as gentle when they were carrying our boys as anyone I'd ever seen. Somehow, our New Guinea helpers always managed to get the wounded men back to safety, no matter how tough that job was. At the nearest native village, our casualties would be taken care of to its week. Everybody in the village turned out to do what they could, including all the Aussies who happened to be hanging around. From then on, the wounded were in the hands of the dock, who pulled the boys through most times. In October 1942, U.S. forces pushed along the coast to a point just below Buna. A Lilliput Navy, made up of pre-war island coastal ships, snaked through the treacherous reefs. The G.I.s made the rest of the trip in outriggers. The New Guinea natives were most cooperative. The G.I.s of the 32nd Division made a novel kind of landing and prepared to drive overland to link up with the Aussies and lay siege to Buna. The necessary supplies which would be needed on that drive were expertly unloaded. The campaign to take Buna was an expensive one for the Allies. Unfortunately, the necessary U.S. strength in ground forces was lacking in northeastern New Guinea during November 1942. The U.S. command, encouraged by the Japanese withdrawal at Milne Bay, expected to take Buna almost without opposition. But the G.I.s who were assigned the task of achieving that seizure were to find the situation quite the opposite. From Port Moresby, the U.S. Air Force reinforced the Allied troops in the Buna area by ferrying soldiers in considerable numbers across the mountains. Plus an occasional stowaway. This was the way to cross the Owen Stanley Peaks. In less than an hour, the troops were making a trip which had taken the 7th Division Aussies almost eight weeks to do on foot. Some 15,000 troops were transported from Port Moresby over the Owen Stanleys to the battle area behind Buna. Thanks to the ferry service provided by the U.S. 5th Air Force, the battle for Buna was soon to change complexion. The jungle didn't slow down these fighting men. At the strips behind Buna, the men and material so vital to the Allied effort were unloaded without delay. Some 20,000 troops and great quantities of equipment were moved north by air during 13 weeks. Again, the New Guinea natives were on hand to assist. The Buna campaign was now progressing into a larger scale Allied offensive. On November 20th, Aussies and GIs joined forces and pressed the attack with renewed spirit. For six weeks, Allied troops invested Buna. The enemy resisted stubbornly, 
But finally, the Japanese defense of the area surrounding that coastal town collapsed. Allied forces took the Japanese who were still alive prisoner and assumed control of Buna on January 2nd, 1943. The enemy hold on the northeastern coast of New Guinea was loosened. In early 1943, the situation in New Guinea began to get brighter, with the eastern section now in Allied hands. After Buna fell, enemy convoys from Rabaul moved westward, bearing reinforcements for their troops at Lai. Allied planes took the offensive. In early March 1943, Allied pilots took off in quest of a Japanese convoy of some 16 ships. North of Cape Gloucester, New Britain, the pilots spotted their prey. This was the occasion all the Aussie and American pilots in the air over the Bismarck Sea had been praying for. But Allied pilots didn't have the air all to themselves. Three days, Allied planes attacked their targets. Not a single Japanese ship escaped undamaged. Allied pilots had a picnic. U.S. and Australian planes sank 12 enemy ships and effectively put an end to this determined Japanese attempt to strengthen their New Guinea ground forces. In September, Allied amphibious forces moved up the back of New Guinea in an assault on the area surrounding Lai. In another leapfrog operation, typical of the Allied campaign on New Guinea, Aussies of the 9th Division invaded Lai to implement the drive overland of U.S. and Australian troops moving west from Puna. The value of fresh amphibious assaults in an extended campaign on a large island was readily apparent by the time Lai was invaded. Progress was far greater than it would have been if the ground forces had pushed overland through thick jungle against heavy troop concentration. On the lengthy New Guinea coastline, landings could often be made at points where the enemy was not prepared to resist. Near Lai, the 9th Division Aussies encountered no opposition on the original landing. Once ashore, they drove inland against scattered resistance. The Aussies caught the defenders of Lai off balance. On September 5th, the eastern claw of the Australian pincer thrust at Lai moved quickly forward. The Australian attack group coordinated its drive with a force of American GIs who were fighting a diversionary action to the south. The fight for the Huon Gulf area was no easy operation. From Port Moresby, American paratroops prepared to fly north to reinforce their brothers in arms fighting in that sector. This airborne assault was personally supervised by the Southwest Pacific Theater commander himself. The paratroopers were to help break the back of enemy resistance at Lai. General MacArthur demanded that the objective be seized at once. 1,700 men of the 503rd U.S. Paratroop Infantry Regiment were to make the jump. Parachute landings in combat were comparatively rare in the Pacific, since the terrain was not often conducive to successful jumps. But on September 5th, 1943, the U.S. troopers took off on a large-scale combat operation. On the success of this jump, depended in large measure the effective wrapping up of the Lai operation. The men were intent on the job ahead. Scores of C-47s transported the paratroops across the Owen Stanleys. 
supported by bombers and fighters. In a B-17, General MacArthur had a ringside seat from which to supervise the entire operation. The general grew especially interested as the planes drew near the jump point. As the vital area was reached, the 820s laid down a smoke screen, which effectively shut off the planes and the paratroopers in the air from the sight of the enemy below. The men prepared for their first combat jump. At 10.22 a.m., the paratroopers went into action. The jump at Natsab went off as smoothly as it had been planned. The men of the 503rd performed like real veterans. In all, several hundred planes participated in the operation so vital to the success of the Lai campaign. The trip to Earth at precisely the spot planned took the paratroopers exactly one minute and ten seconds. The conversion to infantrymen was a matter of very few minutes. A few of the men took a little longer. The Natsab jump greatly improved the Allied position. Salamao fell to the Allies six days later, and a few days after that, Lai itself was in Allied possession. The enemy had been pretty well cleaned out of the entire area. The Allies had another secure position in their westward course along the northern coast of New Guinea. In the fruitless struggle, the Japanese had fought a desperate delaying action. The Aussies entered Lai itself on September 16th. The enemy had completely evacuated the battered coastal town. In the 12-day engagement, the enemy had lost men and equipment in vain. Allied air power had provided the necessary added punch which helped to hasten the Japanese defeat at Lai. The ground gained on New Guinea by virtue of the victory at Lai was considerable. The Japanese-controlled part of New Guinea was still the larger, but it was shrinking fast. With the Lai Salamawa Area 1, the Allied troops consolidated their position and prepared for future assaults against other enemy concentrations in New Guinea. The GIs and Aussies who had taken the Lai area in a truly joint operation moved on to extend Allied control on the Huan Peninsula. But for many, there were a few days in which to relax before going back into action. New Guinea wasn't quite up to the standards of real rest areas, but at least the men could take a short breather. From the airstrips near Lai, now in the light hands, American and Australian planes continued the attack against the enemy without pause. From the new advanced bases, Allied pilots could pound enemy positions in western New Guinea without let up. The missions against Japanese army units, supply dumps, and shipping were stepped up during November and December. By the end of 1943, the enemy in New Guinea was finally completely on the defensive. U.S. 5th Air Force bombers carried the fight to the enemy, softening up the areas where new leapfrogging invasions were already planned. To the eastward, the Japanese-held island of Bougainville was about to occupy the attention of American Marines. On November 1st, 1943, they invaded that island in force. For freedom and justice, for the truth, please let us be mine.